This is Dennis Wendell, archivist and collections curator at the Ames Historical Society. I'm interviewing Zaletta Leiniger Streit on Friday, September 9th, 2011, in the community room of the Ames Public Library. Ms. Streit, do we have your permission to record this interview? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Streit is a former resident of Ames who is in town to make a public presentation later this afternoon. Its title is From Backyard Trapeze to the Greatest Show on Earth, the story of the Leinigers of Ames as told by Zaletta. Just for the record, her name is spelled Z-E-L-L-E-T-T-I-A, but pronounced Zaletta, not Zaletia. And Leiniger is spelled L-E-I-N-I-N-G-E-R, pronounced Leiniger, not Leninger. With Zaletta's permission, I'll use the short form of her name, Z, favored by friends. Is that okay? Right. Good. From the title of her presentation, one would guess that Z was a circus performer. In fact, she is believed to be the only Ames resident ever to make it big time in the big top. During this interview, Z will be telling us about growing up in Ames, learning and teaching dance here, entertaining locally, and finally touring with the big top. So Z, let's start by hearing a bit about your parents and their backgrounds. They seem to be the driving force in your career. Right. Well, <clears throat> they started by uh, taking us to the dancing school from Margie Young, who was an RKO dance master from Hollywood. And she was teaching a special class in Des Moines, Iowa. And one of my cousins used to, well, did take lessons from her, but she was from uh, Hollywood also in a, in a lineup of girls that was being taught by Margie for Hollywood. And she got Margie Young to interview and take my sister and I, for, for which she took my sister first and then me. My sister's two years older than me. Right. And she taught us dancing, which was acrobatic, ballet, uh, tap, uh, just about anything that there was. And she was a very professional woman. Right. Leiniger sounds like a German name. It is German. Mm -hmm. you Actually, it's Prussian. But Prussia was taken over by Germany, and so they considered it German. Of course. What did your father do? My father was a farmer to start with, and a very successful farmer. And then he got into working uh, in the post office, which is a government job. Right. And how about your mother? My mother was a nurse, an mm -hmm. RN, actually. And uh, her really profession was, uh, odd to say, taking care of insane people. Oh, interesting. You mentioned your grandfather also I had an Ames or Gilbert connection. My grandfather owned the gravel pits. This was my mother's father mm -hmm. uh, around Ames here. <clears throat> Outside of Ames, which is now third, well, well, it was 13th Street then, right. on out, and he owned gravel pits out on the far side of 13th uh, Street, way out in the country. Oh, interesting. And he also owned the Ames Hotel, which was on Lincoln Highway. Oh, of course. Now let's learn about you and your siblings, starting in birth order and how they fit into the Laniger Show Troop. So it would be uh, Opal first? Oh, yes. Opal was my oldest sister. Mm -hmm. Oldest a blood sister. I had a, an adopted sister before that, which was Florence. Oh. And she also lived in Ames. Oh, my goodness. Now, uh, Lyle was next? Lyle was my brother, and he was mm -hmm. two years younger than Opal. How did uh, he fit in? He was a drummer, I believe. What's that? How did he fit in? He was a drummer, I believe? <laughs> He was a drummer with Benny Goodman's for a while, hmm. which was a big name band. Nobody knows anything about it nowadays. <laughs> right. But at that time, we had the big named bands, and he played for Benny Goodman. Of course. Was he also? And he was also a magician. He took from Coons, oh. C O O N S, Coons, oh. from Ames here. Uh, he was an Iowa State College magician. Interesting. Interesting. He was clown too in some yeah, of the Yeah, well, he did that on his own. On his own. <laughs> okay, then was Medea? 
Medea was my sister. She's two mm -hmm. years older than me. Mm -hmm. And she's the one that originally started the dancing lessons because she was two years older. <coughs> and so mm -hmm. uh, I imitated whatever she did. So they finally, Margie Young said, for me to take the dancing lessons also. Oh, good. What were Medea's specialties? She was a contortionist. Mm. which means a very close bender acrobat. Mm. And she also did dancing? Yeah, she tap danced. Mm -hmm. And then finally you came on board in what, 24? Well... 1924 was it? Uh, yeah. You were born? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere there? <laughs> right. <laughs> well that sets the era. That sets yes, the era. Uh -huh. Exactly. <clears throat> You lived at two different locations in Ames. Yes, we lived at um, 217 East 12th Street, which was a big two-story house, and my dad owned the house next door to it, which was also a two-story house. Oh, yeah. And um, it was really out in the country then. I mean, on 12th Street was your last. B Avenue was the next street over, and that was it. Oh, yeah. Cemetery was there. Right. So that would have put you in the Beardshire School District. In the Beardshire School. Oh, right. what a wonderful school that was. The oldest one in Ames. Right. And I loved it very much, and we had some wonderful teachers. Right. Do you remember Miss Maybe? Vivian yes, I Maybe? do. She was my third grade teacher. Generations of pupils had her. I, I, I was included in that. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, we had Miss Oxco for the fourth grade, and Miss oh. Ely for the fifth grade, and Miss Harrison for the sixth grade. Oh, amazing. So then you went on to Central Junior High. No, we moved over from oh. there to Grand Avenue, okay. 1320 Grand Avenue, right. which was the, ha the last house in the, in the city limits. Oh. It really was that, rural. At that time. Mm -hmm. Next door was a cornfield. Mm. My goodness, it's hard to imagine. And across the street was a cornfield. Mm. That's where that Seventh Day Adventist church is now. Yes. <clears throat> right. So that later that's years, places at it. the time that we lived there, there were two pine trees that was on that lot that the Seventh Day Adventist church is now. The same ones that are there now, I bet. This the same Seventh Day Amazing. Adventist church. Now the McLaughlin house on the corner we lived up on the hill, which was that next was... door to us. To well, I guess if you're facing the highway, it would be to the left. Right, right. My uncle delivered newspapers there. Oh. I don't know if you knew him, Rod Wendell. He also went to Beardshire. And what was his name? Rod, Roderick Wendell. Roderick, what was his first name? Uh, Roderick. Was it Roderick and? Wendell. Wendell. Mm-hmm. I probably knew him. Yeah. I knew everybody in Beardshire. Right. Well, I think I know now why he liked to deliver papers to the McLaughlins because he would see you and Medea outside on the trapeze. Well, we were out, we were out trying to <laughs> practice. That's, that's great. Or mow the lawn, one <laughs> or the other. <laughs> so you went to a Central Junior High School? Mm-hmm. And uh, did you remember any of those teachers? Um, there was Cap Campbell. I remember Mr. Campbell. I had him for math. Yeah. And uh, I suppose if somebody started me out, I could remember a few more. <laughs> right. And then you went across the street to Ames High, High School. School. Mm -hmm. Right. Do you remember? There was a tunnel, you know, from one school to the other. I don't know if it's still there or not, but. I remember that as well. And we could go down the tunnel to the other school. Did any of the boys ever turn out the lights on you? <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think that our principles were pretty radical. That was good. We didn't have any shenanigans. <laughs> That's good. They were known to have done that. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, like other kids, you patronized the Ames Public Library? Oh, yes. Letha Davidson would have been librarian in that era. Do you remember? Uh, I don't remember their names. But mm. I remember their faces. Yeah. Well, you had to be fairly quiet there. Very quiet. I mean, uh, shh. <laughs> <laughs> How 
How about Carr's Pool? That was a great. When uh, we lived on 217 East 12th Street, we could go across the field of Logston's Dairy. Oh, yes. He had cattle out on that field, but he kept his bull uh, penned in so really? that, that we never were chased. Logston was very good to all of us. <laughs> and we cut through the field there because it was our back, uh, out of our of back course. yard. And to cut through his field, and then there was one small field, and we got to Carr's Pool. Right. Did you personally know Dad and Mom Carr? Yeah, yes. And their children, they adopted uh, several children. Yes, through and the years, a total of 80. Amazing. Yes, I mean, they foster had children. quite a few. And they had one at that time, her name was Donna. Yes, she's still living in Ames. Yes, she's still here. Well, she was, mm -hmm. she was a terrific diver. Right. I read in the newspaper accounts that you won some races there at Carr's Pool. Well, so you must have been a pretty good swimmer. Uh, yes, I mean, uh, Medea, I think, was better okay, than me. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. I was a little scared <laughs> of, of the deep. For, uh, when I did get into the deep, I liked to drown, and the, the young man that <laughs> fetched me out, I told him, I said, you don't need to tell me, I'll go over to the shallow where I belong. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there were a line of logs chained together, oh, yeah. separating. Oh, yeah, to separate. <laughs> um, you knew Joe Gerbrock and his movie theaters. Yes, I worked for Joe many years. I, like I love that man. His flagship was the Collegian Theater. The Collegian Theater and the New Ames Theater and the Capitol. Right. And then one other out at um, College Town, <clears throat> the, the New Ames, and then the, co the Variety, I think. It's Varsity. Varsity. Varsity, mm -hmm. right. So what was your job? I, well, I started out being an usher, uh, uh, usherette. Okay. And then he put me as manager, uh, well, as assistant manager, but. That's I, quite a promotion. Yeah. Well, he was. He was, he was a nice man, and I think he knew my parents. Mm. And um, then he transferred me out to the New Ames Theater, and then he put me in charge of being manager there. Uh, really assistant, I consider it, because there was a man there that also was a manager. Oh, right. For when I wasn't there, Howard was. Okay. So, but anyway, I, I enjoyed the job very mm. much, and I kept everything in top shape. The ashtrays cleaned out, and right, right. nothing on the floor. And Did you have to wear a uniform of yeah, any Yeah, we sorts? wore a blue, a navy blue, a royal blue uniform, oh. a skirt and a jacket. Snappy. We, we wore a white, a white blouse. Mm. You mentioned you had to take care of the bank deposits at night. Yeah. That was after I worked there for a while. Mm. That, and then I would take them from the New Ames mm. and Varsity Theater on mm -hmm. the bus, clearing to the Collegian Theater. My land, without a body guard. Well, later on he suggested that I get a gun. <laughs> and I did. And like I told him, if anybody ever stopped me, I'd give them the money first and say, now, nah, here's the gun. Or I'd give them the gun first and then say, here's the money. <laughs> Goodness. Um, your son, Phil, says you, you still possess that weapon. Yeah, uh, I still, I still, it still works, too. That would be quite an artifact. <laughs> it didn't work at that time because I would be scared. As a matter of fact, I never even had it loaded. Because oh I was scared to death of guns anyway, and so it was never loaded. So I, but like I told uh, Mr. Jabrock, we always called him Joe. I'm Joe. sorry, but I told him I said if anybody ever stopped me, I'd give them the money first, and then the gun second, and say what now? What do you want? <laughs> <laughs> you actually didn't live too far from Joe's. House there. No, he on lived on out north uh, of you. Uh, north mm -hmm. of us, mm -hmm. right. where there wasn't anything really to speak of out there but cornfields. That's right. That's right. How did you become interested in dance and acrobatics and music? Per 
personally, I didn't. That was my mother's idea. Your mother's idea? Yeah. Ah. And uh, so that uh, sounded interesting. Mm -hmm. And first it was Medea that uh, took it because my cousin wanted her to, wanted mom to take her to meet Margie Young in Des Moines. Right. And so Medea took. And then Margie saw me and she said, well, what's wrong with her? And uh, mom said, well, she's two years younger. She said, well, mm -hmm. she said, bring her on in. Mm. And so I thought, goodness sakes. So that's how I started. Well, amazing. I think I was six. My land. Now, you mentioned toe tap dancing. Yeah. What is that? Well, from, with Margie Young, we took acrobatic ballet and um, toe dancing which is from ballet uh -huh. and toe shoes. So I used to tap and toe, uh, tap dance in my toe shoes, which really didn't do them any good. No. no. And so Margie said, what are you doing? And I told her, I said, well, I'm tap dancing on my <laughs> toes here. She said, oh, well, that's very interesting. So she got with my folks and she said, let's put some toe taps on her toe shoes and let's see what she can do. She said, I think we can get tapped. At that time, nobody mm -hmm. toe tapped. She said, I'm sure we can get taps that'll fit on those toe shoes. Stone. So they got the toe taps on mm -hmm. the toe shoes and um, I mm -hmm. took by the ballet bar and hung on to it and tap danced. Oh. And then I thought, oh, I don't need that ballet bar. And I tap danced. Amazing. On my toes. You invented the genre. I must have been, because nobody else has ever heard of it. And mm. the toe taps that they used were different from the toe taps that was mm. eventually put on to my toe shoes. So these shoes were customized for you? Yeah, I guess they were. Now you but mentioned I tap danced on them anyway. There was only one other person in As the United States that, that we did know, this. That, that lived in Cal uh, Hollywood, California. Mm -hmm. But she kept coming down. She would get oh. up and do a step and then come down and then get back up. And I just mm -hmm. stayed on my toes and did wings, mm -hmm. which is probably nobody knows what wings are, but mm -hmm. it's both feet going out and shuffling, hitting and, oh. and so on like oh. that. I wish we had photos. I do too. Or motion pictures of I you do doing too. that. I do too. I wish you could, because it's hard for me to explain what it is. Exactly. <laughs> that must have taken incredible strength in your I suppose your it feet. did, but you know, it never dawned on to me. Uh, mm. I was too interested in what I was doing to worry about muscles or strength or what have you, you know. Right, right. Uh, we saw in your scrapbook. <clears throat> A program and it said music by the Shrine Orchestra. To me that would indicate that you were performing in the KRNT Shrine Theater. Yes we did quite a bit. Which was an immense facility and you and Medea were given many uh, credits in that program. Well we performed for the Shriners and the Masons quite mm. a lot. Mm. As a matter of fact quite a bit. <laughs> Well, you were young to be a showgirl at that time. Well, we were, yes, we were young, but we were very obedient and mm -hmm. very ladylike. Mm -hmm. And um, they hired us mm -hmm. for many, many different things. Mm -hmm. So Marjorie taught you poise as well. Well, I, I assume that that's where we got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she had an assistant by the name of Anne that oh. helped with the ballet. Oh. And when you take ballet in, back in those days, you, you learned to be very um, professional. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Anne, there was an Anne Dirksen in Ames that also taught dance. Did you know her family? Yes. <clears throat> I can't now remember, Kellogg I think is where they lived, I'm not certain, mm -hmm. and um, Anne was younger than me, oh. quite a bit younger. Uh -huh. uh, 
Her father was Oli, I believe. I, I don't know. I just knew the mother. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Duane, I think, was the brother. Oh, my goodness. I understand from reading articles that you had an exceptional, clear singing voice when you were young. Well, when I was young. At least something's happened to us. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take lessons in voice? From Talbot McRae, I, I was the Professor Talbot McRae. I mean, believe me, Professor. Yes. I mean, you didn't call it by oh. Mr. Talbot or anything, you Professor. Yes, he was a big name he, he to was be reckoned a, with. <laughs> he was a very good instructor. That's, that's great. How did you learn ventriloquism? Accidentally. I used to, uh, I was a doll player. I played with dolls. I had 15 of them. 15? I know. Quite a collection. <laughs> well, they were all in good shape. And uh, I would talk for them. And I didn't want the, my lips to be moving when I'm talking for a doll. <laughs> so I didn't move my lips. And that was quite young. I mean, when I was playing with dolls. Gee. So my dad saw me talking for my dolls without moving my lips in a different voice. Mm. And that really actually is where it started. Then he bought me a ventriloquist doll, the homeliest thing you ever <laughs> did see. It would scare anybody to death. He was that ugly. But nevertheless, his mouth moved. When my doll's mouth didn't. So I talked for him, and his name was Willie. Willie. And so that started me talking ventriloquism with Willie. So you were self-taught, really? Actually, yes. Amazing, amazing. And you took your uh, act on the road show then? Well, um, let's say my dad did. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That must have been quite a variety show with all it of your really, siblings. It really was. It was uh, that was what made us really so well known and and actually they they contacted us to hire us for different shows in different towns. I noticed that you performed in Gilbert, Ames, Story City, Boone, Nevada, Cambridge and other states all as well. All over the whole state and Missouri and some up in Minnesota Amazing. and um, we went as far as Omaha, but... Um, How did you travel? Well, we had a, a paraphernalia trailer, is what mm -hmm. we called mm -hmm. it, held, held all of the trapeze rigans and ropes mm -hmm. and ties and everything. And then we had another trailer that my dad built into a house trailer. Oh. We didn't have house trailers when we first started out. Oh. And he built it into what he called a cooking trailer for us to eat in. This would be in the 1930s then? This what? 1930s? Yes, this, this era. it was in the 30s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, amazing. Newspaper accounts of attendance figures amazed me. 500 in Cambridge, 700 at Camerar. I didn't know those towns had such Populations. Well, they came from everywhere when they found out that we were going to perform. That's why they, mm -hmm. we were hired by so many different towns. I see. Because we had a reputation as being, having on a good show. Right. Now, in one photo, it said on the side of your trailer, free acts. The you acts, didn't perform for free. No. No. The city paid us. I see. But the, the stages were built on, like usually on Main Street, a big stage. And we used our trailer house that my dad built for a dressing room, and it would be parked behind the stage. I see. And then we performed on the stage, and we would set, he would set the trapezes up on the stage. Of all things, how did he anchor those? Well, it, they anchored on down, and they would, believe it or not, they pounded these big stakes nine of them for each uh, pulley uh, mm. into the the concrete or what not. It wasn't concrete, it was a black top, I guess it would be. Mm. And they pounded those nine those stakes about that high into the ground till about that high. Mm. And then they wrapped the ropes around them to make the pulleys mm -hmm. and to hold the, hold the, the right. trapeze up. 
You never had mechanical failures, though, with these. No, when my dad staked out one of those into those grounds, I mean, mm -hmm. he made sure that, that this was his girls that was up there performing. That's right. And he made sure that that rigging stayed put. They were stable. Well, you kids must have been a key source of family income, the, uh, the show. Quite so. Did you ever receive an allowance or anything? Well, we also taught dancing into the, the little building that we had next to us. So right. it really started out being a gymnasium or something, private school to learn in, mm -hmm. practice in, and we taught dancing in it. So we made money that way too. So was that your personal income then? Personal income. I see. As one drives by 13th and Grand today, you see the main house and then set back a tiny house. That was our private school. What it was, was an, an old country schoolhouse that they didn't use anymore. And we had it moved from out south of Ames, mm -hmm. I don't know where, mm -hmm. into our lot that Dad had a basement dug and oh. put it over the basement. All right. That makes a lot of sense now. I was there the other day and the backyard seemed absolutely immense. Well, we did have a pretty good size, believe me, it was a pretty good size yard because Medea and I mowed it. Hmm. So where were the trapezes uh, set? On the lot next uh, to the houses here facing the, the road, mm -hmm. and that was all our land. That was pretty public rehearsal area. Well, it was right on the highway, and we rehearsed out there, and we had lots of um, audiences. Because well, a lot yes. of people would come up and stop. In public view. And watch while we practice. You said they would stop and park? And park out by, be, between the road and our land. Hmm. Yeah. And watch us. Free entertainment. Yeah. You mentioned they sometimes would picnic there? Yeah. Well, we kept it nicely mowed, mainly because we practiced out there. And you were the main lawnmower. And my sister and I were the, <laughs> believe me, the main, I can tell you, it was a pretty good sized land. <laughs> <laughs> That's astounding. Well, this was during the Great Depression, a defining moment in, in your life, and yet you seem to be enjoying these activities. Yeah. Um, you must have had a passion. Well, you know, I, I think children were raised different back when I was a kid than what mm. they are now. Mm. And um, we were interested in doing things and being something and, and uh, taking part in things. Right. And we weren't the only ones that were interested in that, but other kids were interested in obedience also. Right. Well, in that era, names like Medea and Zaletta were pretty exotic. Do you think your father had planned that you would be show stars someday? No, I don't think he had any idea really? at all. That he just liked the names, and he named us. Unique names, unique spellings. Absolutely. The what? Unique names and unique spellings. <laughs> <laughs> well, he named Opal and Lyle, too. And Opal could never figure out why he gave her such a simple name. <laughs> I understand that one time you did a so-called recital at the Ames Band Show. And we sure did. What was that like? Well, that was quite a show. But um, we decided, my, Medea and I, that we would really give Ames a show. We performed all over for mm -hmm. tri-states, actually, and everything, and nothing that ever been performed in Ames. Amazing. So we, Medea got the town fathers to let us use the band shell. Mm -hmm. And we had to pay just a little fee or something for the lights. Mm -hmm. So, and she was the one that got with them for the lights and everything. Mm -hmm. So we performed in the band shell. And so what did we do? We called in the troupe. Mm -hmm. We thought, well, we'll give them a show. So we called in the troop, set up the tight wire, and set up the trapeze. Oh. And 
I took the vocal lessons from Professor Talbot McRae, so I told him that I was going to sing. And so he, I, I had an idea he would be there, which he was. Okay. And um, we gave him a show. I bet you did. So you were on the stage, and then in front of the stage was the trapeze. Was the trapeze and tight wire. Explain tight wire as opposed to high wire. Well, it's seven feet high, and it's about as big around as my little finger. It's not a cable, not it's a, cable. a wire. And it was pulled tight, I would say maybe, um, I'm not sure, but at least 12 feet long. Mm. If not 12 feet, it would be 14 feet. Mm -hmm. And it was pulled out to stretch it tight, stretch it. so that it was really tight. Mm -hmm. And um, we performed on that. You had special shoes then? We had uh, like um, a, a real soft leather. leather for your soul, and you bought the yeah you bought the shoes. Oh. The, the the shoe was a was canvas, oh. a lightweight canvas, and the sole was like a chamois skin. I see. So it wouldn't cut into your foot. Yeah. So that you could feel that wire. Mm -hmm. You had to feel the wire. It didn't hurt you, but right. You could feel it. So what acts would you do on the wire? Well, we did little dance steps, which were. And we would run on it, mm. and um, Medea did a split on mm. it, and I jumped the different hoops, which would be about um, that high from the wire. Oh. The wire springs you. I'm mean, not a high jump, but the wire gives you a spring, and you have to learn how to, it's difficult. You have to learn mm. how to spring it to get you to jump into this mm. hoop, and then out of that hoop into the other hoop, and out of that hoop into the wire, and wow. then go on to your end. Did you ever fall down? Yeah, <laughs> quite a few times. Seven feet? <laughs> when you, uh, you learn after one or two falls. You'd be surprised how quick you learn a lot of things. So in training, you started low. On um, training, you start off about like that. Mm -hmm. And then you go up a couple of feet. Mm. And then you go up a little higher. And finally you go up seven feet. Amazing that you could land on the wire. You learn. We saw photos in your album of that. You, you learn. You have, you spot a, at the end of the wire. You keep, you don't look down because if you look down you see all kinds of wires. Right. So you have a spotter at the end of the wire that you look at. Oh. And as you notice when you saw me in the pictures where I jumped, I'm looking, because I'm up in the air moving around, I'm looking for my spotter. Would that be who, your father? Who was the spotter? Uh, a little round thing about that big around. Oh, oh, I see. That was tie down to the end of the, uh, to the wire. Oh, not, not a person. Oh, no. Yeah, uh -uh. No. no. I see now, right. You mentioned that your father rented land south of Ames for yes, a garden. Yes, gardening. Was it three acres? I mean, it seemed yes, immense. Yes, and most of them was in tomatoes. Tomatoes? Yeah. What did you do with all of them? Well, he gave all of the neighbors around us that would take them mm -hmm. and can them, but very few of them did. And my mother mm -hmm. canned at least 900 quarts every, uh, every Nine summer. 900? Yeah. You really. girls helped her? Well, we had to help peel them. Peel them. Mm -hmm. Kind of like people give away Sugini today. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, anybody could have had any of and all that they wanted of the a yard goods, and you, because it was still uh, depression-like, right? It, things were pretty hard, hard up then yet. So you had a good source of fresh vegetables. Oh, you yes. had sweet corn too, I suppose. Oh yes, my mother dried it. How, how how did that work? Well, it was good, but how it was done, I'm not all that sure. But she boiled the sweet corn, and then she cut it off from the cob, and then she put it out on racks 
to dry in the sun, and Medea and I were to stand there and shake, make sure that no birds or flies or anything. <laughs> you don't need that flavoring, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, and when it, after a while, then she gathered it back in, and uh, she, it was bagged up in certain bags. I don't know. It's been many years. I don't do it. <laughs> well, that, that's something. Uh, what else besides corn and tomatoes? Did you have lettuce? Green and, beans. And beans? And peas. Mm. And carrots. And the carrots were put in a big barrel with, with um, sand. Sand? Hmm. And it lasted all winter long. You could dig around in that sand and get your, oh, like geez. a fresh carrot. Oh, be. Not salt or anything, just sand. Yeah, just sand. I hadn't heard of that. Well, my dad was quite a farmer. I mean, he was quite Truly. a... The Truly. Prussian in him came out in produce. Apparently. Well, that, that's, that's, that's interesting. Now, you and do I do it? No. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> So you must have had uh, an incredible diet with all these fresh vegetables, um, extremely my, healthy. We, we were, my mother was very strict on what we ate. Mm. We ate no pork, ah. and we ate very, very few fried foods. That was good. That was good. We had baked or, or uh, broiled, or what, but mm -hmm. very few fried foods. Were French fries common in that era? Well, but we never had them. Never had them anyway. But they, you could mm -hmm. uh, sneak out <laughs> and get a French fry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you started playing with circuses. You said in 1941, a spotter found you and you were invited to join Ringling yes, Brothers, yes. Barnum and Bailey. Right. Top of the line. What that was Pat Valdo that uh, hired us to, uh, <clears throat> I went to the backyard, as they call it, of the circus, and Pat Valdo saw me and motioned for me to come over, and so I went over, and, uh, and hmm. he said, I'm Pat Valdo, and I said, well, I'm Zaleva Leniger, <laughs> and he said, yeah, I know, and I smiled. He said, you've got a million dollar smile. How would you like to work for Ringlings? I said, um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> had he seen you perform at all? Uh, I don't know whether he had seen us or if he had heard of us. Oh. But he asked me if I would like, he said, would you work for Ringlings? And I said, well, I don't work without my sister. And he said, well, we'll take your sister, too. A package deal. So you were billed as the Leiniger twins. Well, how that happened is we did twin performance. What she did, I did. I see. If she did a back bend, I was doing a back bend also. If she did a limber, I was doing a limber also. What is a limber? Well, that's where you put your hands down and kick on over and put both feet down on the floor on the other side. I see. A lot of specialized terms. Right. And a walkover is where you put your hands down, kick on over, and split your legs into a split. Oh. And land one leg, and then come on up and land on the other. Hmm. Why right, land? And a backover is where you go back into a back band and kick on over one leg and then the other. Oh. Did you ever have any uh, accidents that you needed treatments? Well, not while we're Any falls and bruises? Not while we're performing. Mm -hmm. Well, we, when you were ready to perform, you were ready to perform. You were good. Yes, you had no quims nor qualms about what you were going to do. Mm -hmm. So you were out of aims for months at a time. Yes. Mm -hmm. You went by road or train? On Ringlings, you went by train. When we were on our own show troop, we had uh, trailer houses pulled by cars. Mm -hmm. So tell me about the trains. Uh, there were certain classes of people that were assigned certain right. cars. There are four different trains. Sounds impossible now, mm -hmm. but there were four different trains. Each with their own steam engine? Each with their own steam engine. Astounding. And uh, our train was, um, 
I think that our, ours was, the performers was number three. Number one was the equipment mm -hmm. to set up the big top. This was on ringlings. All the tents and, and stakes. And on ringlings, understand, it was like a, a miniature city, wherever they set up at. Mm. It was that big. This is back when? In the heyday, the golden age. Right. right. So the equipment took one train. The working people <clears throat> and, um, and I think the elephants, because they helped upset up the tent. The well, of course. And the third was the rest of the equipment, bleachers and things like that for, uh, and sideshows and etc. and so on. Mm -hmm. And number four was the performers. Oh, you're a special class. Yeah. We came in on number four train. How did you sleep on, on the well, train? Well, they have berths. Berths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And each person is signed a berth and you decorate your little berth to suit yourself. Mm -hmm. and and uh, you made your own bed and everything. And on wash day, where they sent the sheets out, you didn't make the bed. Oh. The porter made the bed that day. Oh, deluxe. So were you um, in charge? I mean, were you kind of minded by a preceptus? We had a, um, a porter, mm -hmm. Lillian was her name, mm -hmm. that uh, took charge of us, that mm -hmm. when we got off from the bus that bussed us from the circus lot to the train where the train sleepers were. Then um, a man by the name of Larson saw to it that we got off the bus and into the train. And Lillian, who was the porter, saw to it that we got on the train and to our bunks. I see. How long would you stay at a venue? Just one day? Usually just one day, but in through the east, uh, when we showed in Madison Square Garden, we were there for six weeks. Oh. And we stayed in hotels then. Oh, deluxe, indeed. So how did they feed you? In, in New York, <clears throat> you were assigned a certain restaurant, hmm. and you ate in that restaurant. And they picked up the tab, the... Uh... I, ringlings. I guess they did because mm -hmm. all we did was eat there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Otherwise you would eat in a uh, tent? Otherwise we eat in the cookhouse. Mm. How did that work? Well, you had, when you came, when the bus picked you up off from the train, then the bus would take you to cookhouse, mm. which was a big tent with dining tables in it with white tablecloths. Mm. Very, very elegant. Very nice. Mm. And you're a waiter. It was waiter. never a wait, waitress, it was always a waiter. And each one of us, each table of us, had our own special waiter. I'm surprised. So, then when we would go in, we sat in a special place. We never sat in something different. You always sat in exactly the same place where you always sat. That was your seat right. in the cookhouse. And your waiter came over and asked you, um, usually two, maybe three different things that you could order. And I remember mm -hmm. on, I believe it was Thursday, we had tongue and ham and cabbage. Cabbage, what a you combination. Would never forget that. <laughs> so, and I didn't eat the ham, so I always took the tongue and cabbage. Tongue, spinach, and cabbage was your two. <laughs> that was lunch. <laughs> Did you ever have liver? <laughs> no. It was always they always your same things. Always had two different choices for your lunch and supper. <laughs> but I remember tongue and cab and tongue and and the uh, ham. I mean, nobody can forget that. No, that's truly unforgettable. So I took the spinach and the cabbage. So if you were going to perform, would you eat uh, or avoid a heavy meal? No, you. that's why this was lunch. Mm -hmm. I don't think everybody ate the spinach and the cabbage. And the so when would you perform? Uh, in the afternoon? Afternoon and evening. And evening, two mm -hmm. shows. Yeah, and in each time, you took a bucket bath two times. A so you had bath. four bucket baths during the day. 
Oh, a bucket bath. You took a complete bath in a bucket. Oh. Now that's quite a, an ordeal on its own. Your buckets are pretty good sized buckets, but you can stand up in them. Oh. And good. then you stoop down with your, your bucket cup and pour your water over you and mm. soak yourself down from head on down. Mm. And then you take your water and pour it back over. And you are required to take four baths a day. Wow. So you're not dirty. No. Did you have a special tent as a bathroom? Yeah, it was our pad tent, which is called a pad tent because it's your dressing room. Oh. And your trunk and your chair and your four buckets mm. set out in front of it, of that'd, each person. That'd be cold water. Very cold. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. Now you're required to do that. You're not just asked. You're no. told. You take four baths a day. You said there were other protocols. No smoking? Oh, we never, no, no smoking or drinking. Oh, my. I mean, you were fired. Mm. So no, no drinking, no smoking, no swearing. Mm, no foul language. And Ooh. when you came out of the girls' dressing room, you there was 10 feet across for the men to get out of their dressing room. And if you wanted to talk to the boys, there was a paraphernalia trunk that was about that high. The men had one and the women had one. And we women sat on ours and the men sat on theirs and we could talk back and forth. That was only 10 feet across. <laughs> Surprising. I didn't realize uh, a it was lot so of strict. people have no idea. I didn't no have no gum chewing. No gum chewing. No, because you may uh, have the gum in your mouth when you go to perform, and you might suck it down your lungs or right. your your breath, right. even down your throat. And of course, you were the representatives of the circus, had to make a good impression. They had a very strong impression. You mm -hmm. did as you were told to do. Hmm. So how were you paid? On a, on a weekly basis? On, on the week, every week. Mm. And then you were required to tip your different helpers, like your waiter in the cookhouse, right. and the, the bus driver, and uh, mm. the porter that took care of you mm. in, in the there. We what? didn't tip uh, unless we wanted to our wardrobe mistresses. Oh. What would a, a tip be? Five dollars. Five dollars? Uh-huh. That, that's on a weekly basis, though. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what would your salary have been, then? The salaries were always very good. Very good. Okay, good. So... And the more you did, <clears throat> the more acts you did, the, you usually got $25 for an, a, a different act. I if you, see. Whatever you would hire that, then after that, mm -hmm. if you did another act, you got another 25 a week. If you did another act and they give you another 25, it would be 50 a week. Right. So how many acts did you and Medea typically do? Well, I did more than her. Mm. And um, uh, I got in with the roller skaters. So I was a roller skater. Oh, Never again. And <laughs> I mean, <laughs> one year of it was enough. And um, I was to learn bareback riding <clears throat> and by the Christianis. Oh, and I yes, went in to learn the bareback riding act. And Papa Christiani was there to teach me. And I said, Papa, what is the switch for, for the horse? And he said, oh no, the horse know his act. I said, Papa, you just lost yourself a bareback rider. <laughs> If the horse knew he was acting, the switch wasn't for him. I knew who the switch was you for. Knew, you drew the so conclusion. So Papa just lost his bareback rider. What were the horses like? They were big, um, like your, what, what are your big-footed animals? Uh, Clydesdales. What is it? Clydesdales. Yeah. Clydesdales. And they were white, always white. Oh, mm -hmm. nice. And they knew their act. Mm. And the bareback riders that performed was the Christianis from Italy. They did oh. somersaults in the air with on and landed on the oh, other horses right. behind, and they were very good. 
Right. You mentioned the other day one particular horse, Eagle Eye. Eagle Eye. That was the horse that I rode. Tell to, us about that. To, well, Eagle Eye, that since I came from Iowa, they assumed that I was a um, farmer enough to know how to ride horses, which I did. Mm. Iowa State horses, you know, were very presentable at that That's time. True. So, yeah, I rode horses. So they, real cunning like, gave me Eagle Eye. And Eagle Eye was the meanest little horse that you could ever imagine. He, Eagle Eye was his good name for him because his, he, he watched with his eyes exactly. And he had the habit, so I found out, of course, inquiring from the older circus girls and all, and hearing them talk, ha ha ha, ha she's got Eagle Eye and everything. Eagle Eye had a habit of taking you around the Hippodrome track and when he got you down to the bleachers, which was at the end of the hippo, the, the track around the you know, the They call that the Hippodrome. Hippodrome. Okay. He would throw you up into those bleachers. Oh, so I made friends with Mr. Eagle Eye. I took him sugar and I took him mm -hmm. apple mm -hmm. and I petted him and I took him carrots <laughs> and I was Oh, it's so sweet. So Eagle and I, we got to be real close friends. So when it comes opening time, everybody's waiting for me to ride Eagle Eye. <laughs> and Eagle Eye and I went, tip, 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 come on around. He stopped and did his bows and, and we did our performances and everything else. <laughs> and everybody's watching. <laughs> but I had made friends with Mr. Eagle Eye. So later on, a, a little girl from Germany said, oh, I can ride anything, if she, uh, because I wasn't well that day. Oh. So she could ride Eagle Eye. So everybody grinned, <laughs> ear to ear. So she, Hilda was her name, oh. I will never forget. She <laughs> rode Eagle Eye, and he took her around to the bleachers and threw her off. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone ever get hurt when they were No, close? I mean, <laughs> you, when you got thrown up into there, usually you can land on your feet. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't miss. <laughs> oh, gracious. That's amazing. See, there's funny things that happen on the circus that nobody ever knows about. <laughs> exactly. Now, eventually, you, you left the circus, and you got married at some point, too. Yes. How did you meet your future husband? Actually, uh, by our dancing school, because in wintertime, Medea and I would teach ballroom dancing. Oh. And so, uh, my husband, a boy, uh, I didn't know him then, but anyway, he came to, he had been, I was working for Joe Jabrock to start with, and I was the uh, manager, assistant manager, out at New Ames Theater. Right. And he would come in and um, always flirt. This was Philip Strife. Yes, uh-huh, mm -hmm. and everything, but I always took it told him where to set <laughs> and everything. So he found out through the cashier, Betty Grimes was at that time, where I, that I taught dancing. Oh. And so he called up and got registered in for a dancing lesson. And he got Medea. <laughs> and so I saw him out there, so I, want, I went out and Medea said, do you know this? Uh, young man. This is Phil Strife. I said, uh, yeah. I said, he didn't come here to take a dancing lesson. I said, he came here because he wanted to meet me. <laughs> amazing, amazing. And so he, he admitted, yes. He said, I couldn't meet you out there. You gave me a ticket stub and sent me on. <laughs> what was his major? Um, electrical engineering. Oh. So when did you get married? December the 12th, 1945. 45. So what did he do for a living then? Well... Was he employed by the circus? No, at that time yeah. he was some kind of a salesman for some kind of, of um, uh, cosmetics and things. Oh, I see. And um, after starring to death through that, <laughs> uh, I decided to go back on the circus. So I told him, I said, now I've starved long enough and I'm going back on, out on the circus. Mm. And so I left and joined um, a circus. Mm. 
And so I was out on it for a few months. And he finally found out where I was through my sister, because it's hard to keep up with the circus. We move so. every day. And, but my sister knew where we were, Opal. Mm -hmm. So he came, he said, I'm either coming out or you're coming back. I said, well, I'm not coming back. Mm. I mean, I've been hungry long enough. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm out here where I'm making money and eating. <laughs> Reality. So he came out. And uh, we were working for Jack Mill, uh, Mills Brothers Circus at that time. And so uh, I asked Jack if he would hire him. He said, well, what can he do? I said, he can't do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there was nothing he could do. And Jack said, oh, well, um, hmm, let me see. I, so he said, well, he said, bring him around. He said, I'll train him. So I said, oh, well, okay. So I brought him in. So Jack says to him, punk, what can you do? And oh, <laughs> <laughs> you were scared to death, and I'm standing back there in the corner. I thought, oh, oh boy, is, is Jack really the owner of the circus? Has really given him the, the works, you know. And finally, after training him on and talking to him and everything, he said that he would give him a job as a salesman. Mm -hmm. Since he said, I think that you can sell. So he Sounds gave him a, some work on the, took him, sent him out with a, uh, another man to teach him the advance on the circus oh, and that's where your money is anyway of course so he taught him the advance and he learned mm -hmm. and he got to be number one man oh terrific that's that's great that's great uh, one time you said you were in Madison Square Garden and knocked someone down a famous cowboy. Yes. And I had no idea. I was running through the halls in order to get to the door that let me out to the Hippodrome track to do my act. And I was buttoning or something, a costume, because I was late. And I ran into Mr. Ringling and Gene Autry. This would be John Ringling North? Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I looked up just in time to smack into him. And it knocked both of us down. Oh, no. So I said, oh, 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 pardon me. I mean, and he said, yeah, pardon me. So anyway, we got up, and I, I went out to do my performance looking back. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's a great story. Well, you were in Toronto, Hollywood, Madison Square Garden, all over. Yes. What a career. You must still have fabulous memories of those days. Well, at the time, it didn't seem all that terrific. It was mm -hmm. just a, an everyday living, mm -hmm. you know. Well, we often hear of a kid wanting to run off and join the circus. You did that, and you succeeded exceptionally well. Yeah, I didn't run off. I mean... Yeah, you were, you were hired. <laughs> that, that's true. There's very, very few that actually run off to join a circus, yeah. really. Yeah, they would have no talent to offer. They, you, you have to know something. Right. Well, later in life, in your scrapbook, I saw that you had a dance studio in Adele, Iowa. Yeah, wherever I moved, I opened a dancing school. Hmm. Usually, as soon as people found out who I was oh. and everything, they, are you going to teach dancing here or mm -hmm. do something? so? It was quite profitable. Oh. Did you ever track some of your students? Did they go on and yes. achieve great I had, careers? I had quite a few of them that uh, went on to be, I don't know what they used as a name, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of, yes, especially in, in Overland Park, Kansas. Hmm. Do any of them ever still keep in touch with you? Actually, no, because I moved quite a bit, and oh. it was very difficult to keep in touch mm -hmm. with me. And they move quite a bit. If they mm -hmm. get into show business or professional, they're, they're out. Right. Now, you uh, ended up in Loosedale, Mississippi. Loosedale, a little town of Loosedale, Mississippi. I don't know how big it is. 
anybody has any idea what the population and is. And your son, Phil, drove you up here. Yes. To My see son, your Phil, lives cousin? about a half of a, a fourth of a block, I'd say, from me, across the street from me. I understand that he built you a little cottage. He certainly did. A 14 room, three bathroom <laughs> cottage with a swimming pool and a, another bathroom out there. Three bathrooms. <laughs> well, three bathrooms in the house. Oh. This is the outdoor bathroom for the pool. Oh. That's number four. Oh, amazing. <laughs> amazing. Well, and we I want... am the keeper of the house. <laughs> well, we owe a debt of thanks to Phil for oh. driving you up here. I know you're visiting your cousin Marilyn. Yes. And so we took the opportunity to do this oral history yeah. and, of course, book you for the And I want you to know I have one wonderful son. I think so, too. Because wherever I want to go, he takes me. And I feel perfectly safe with him. He takes care of me. He's a great guy. He's a terrific son. He really is. Well, Z, I think it's time to be wrapping things up. Thank you so much for sharing your recollections I've with it. us. You've given us a great insight into the contributions of the Laniger family to Ames and well beyond. You brighten the lives of thousands of people during the difficult years of the Great Depression. Because you saved archival material and shared that in your memories with the Ames Historical Society, the Laniger legacy will live on. Thanks again. Well, thank you for having me.